Colleagues uh, and everybody, Deputy President, Honorable Ministers, uh, dear colleagues from the Media Fraternity, I wish to take this opportunity to welcome you all here. It's indeed our pleasure to provide this platform for you to interact with the Deputy President and the Ministers that are here. Essentially, this is going to be a Q&A session. We've said the deputy, all of you have covered the deputy president in all his interactions here at WEF. You have covered the activities of the South African delegation that has been here. So there would be no need for us to read a statement as would be standard in any press briefing. So this is a Q&A session for you to interact with the leadership here. But we want to request you that remember we're in Kigali. So this Q&A session is simply about our activities here in Kigali, the World Economic Forum on Africa. So on that note, I, I wish to welcome the Deputy President. I wish to welcome uh, the Minister in the Presidency, Jeff Khadebe, Mini our Minister of Post and Telecommunication, Minister Twele, and uh, most of you would know our Ambassador, George Twala. I don't know if the Deputy President would want to just say a word or two before we can take a question. And then uh, we, we will ask all of you to identify yourself as a standard for the purposes of the leadership here. Thank you very much, Ronnie. We uh, thank all of you for being here and also welcome this opportunity of doing what they call a wrap-up. And Minister Jeff Hadebe uh, on my right here and uh, Minister Dr. Koele on my left here uh, will take all the questions, as they always do, uh, about anything and everything. Uh, as you heard, our ambassador is on the extreme right. We've, we've spent uh, the last two days, and in Dr. Kuele's case, three days here, uh, interacting with a number of people. This, this has been a most fruitful forum uh, not only for us in government, but also for the private sector and uh, state-owned enterprises that have uh, been delegates at this uh, forum. We've had an opportunity of uh, listening to really clever inputs from a number of people, and we've also enjoyed the hospitality of uh, President Paul Kagame, and indeed have benefited a great deal from uh, what he has had to say more broadly as an African leader, but also what he has had to share with all of us about the success and the steps that they are making to make Rwanda a great uh, place for investment. And we congratulate uh, Rwanda for the incredible strides that they have made and we thank the people of Rwanda for being so warm and welcoming to all of us and congratulate President Kagame for arranging uh, this wonderful forum here in Kigali. Kigali for us as South Africans has been almost like an oasis. We've come here to, to draw wisdom, but at the same time, we've also come here to make connections from our business delegates with a number of other business uh, people from across the world. A number of them have uh, informed us that they've made good connections, they've got great business uh, contacts, great business connect, uh, co uh, possibilities for contracts, and this is precisely what we expected of the South African businesses that are here that they should be coming to these types of forums to make contact with a number of business people and move from contact to contract. And uh, this we're beginning to see happening uh, with our own eyes. And on the government side, we've uh, had the joy of uh, uh, being in the presence of a number of other countries uh, from a leadership level at the top with heads of states as well at the, as at the ministerial level. And our ministers have been 
busy at work making presentations, contributions in a number of uh, side uh, forums that are part of this broad forum here. So we've made contributions, we've uh, showcased South Africa as a destination for investment. We've showcased what we are doing, even in these trying economic times. And as the theme of the conference has been how uh, we can uh, connect uh, Africa digitally and utilize the resources that we have, we've been able to relate our own journey, a journey of spreading ICT among South Africans and uh, what the future looks like and what the future portends in as far as this task that uh, we've embarked upon. We've been very pleased to hear that our state-owned enterprises that have come here have also had occasion to interact uh, with other state-owned enterprises as well as other business entities. And a number of them have uh, pleasantly informed us that they've formed good connections and there are business possibilities also for our state-owned enterprises. Uh, those that have been here have been ESCOM, including uh, developmental fu uh, uh, funding institutions like the IDC, the, uh, uh, um, the DBSA. The, the DBSA. Uh, they've all been here and they've been interacting very well with a number of people. So our journey here as South Africans, as a South African component or as Team South Africa has been really worthwhile, worthwhile in a number of ways and uh, we believe that uh, we've been able to, to send the message very clearly that uh, South Africa is a good place for investment. But it's also been worthwhile to be uh, walking in tandem with a number of other African countries We've uh, been here to applaud the success that a number of countries are making on a number of fronts, to be part of the region, to be part of the continent, and to be part of this developing story where a number of African economies are reforming, uh, advancing forward on a number of fronts, infrastructure, ICT, delivery of really good uh, services to, to, to ordinary people on the continent. And we can testify, having been there, that indeed Africa is on the move. Africa is moving ahead, is charging ahead on a number of fronts. Much as the global economy uh, is a bit gloomy, uh, the, the sense and the deep feeling that we all have here is that we go home renewed, revived, that we are part of the African continent that's on the move, that is growing, and uh, uh, we, we, we are part of this big engine that is Africa that is growing on a number of fronts. So our presence here has been a really good and meaningful presence, uh, all of us, uh, to a man and woman, we thought that this forum has been really, really meaningful and fruitful. Thank you very much. I thank uh, the Deputy President for his uh, kind remarks. May I also take this opportunity, Deputy President, to extend on, your, on behalf of yourself and the delegation to the leadership of WEF for making this facility available for us. They are also live streaming. We also welcome in the, our viewers from home coming through the platform of SAPC. I think, uh, colleagues, if I'm not wrong, you want to engage the deputy president and the ministers. Our sister here from CNN is laughing. Stephen Crotes, you wanted to bell the cat. Yes? yes. Very good morning, uh, ministers and uh, Mr. Deputy President. Eleni Jokos from CNN. Uh, I've spent a couple of weeks outside of South Africa and engaging with CEOs. Some of the things that I get asked is, uh, you know, how is South Africa right now? We're really worried. Um, you know, should we be worried? Are you getting the same thing when you're engaging with CEOs at this point in time? And is there concern about the political landscape? Thank you. I'll take a few questions. Here's one. Very thank you, Mr. Vice President. My name is Ethan Tashobi. I work for the New Times, Rwanda. For Africa, 
Africa is moving forward, you said, and uh, to move even further, we need integration. Um, I want to, to hear from you about uh, Rwanda and South Africa's bilateral relations, knowing that uh, at some point it was not the best that we, everyone wished for, especially when there was issues with the FDRL and uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, and uh, South Africa were not understanding each other. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman there is uh, good morning, Mr. Deputy President, Ministers, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Stephen Krutis from Eyewitness News in Johannesburg. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, may I ask, why should someone spend money in South Africa when they can put it in an economy like Rwanda's, which is growing much faster, where policy is created quickly and implemented quickly, we can't even sort out digital, terrestrial, television, or a mining rights bill. And especially when it can look to an outsider, like parts of our government are almost in conflict with other parts of our government. Thank you. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, uh, Deputy President. Uh, non Premier Losiziba from SABC. I just wanted to ask a question around uh, integration. Uh, when you have come to these sorts of forums every year, is Africa any closer to getting to the kind of integration that we need to get intra-Africa trade uh, beyond the current 10%, 12% that it's at? Um, here in Rwanda, I noticed that they let people who live in the Eastern African region just come into the country with IDs. When are we going to see a scenario when South Africa's borders are more open uh, precisely for the reason of you know mobility and job creation etc etc oh yeah, the last two for this round um, thank you very much for your time gentlemen mm. Raman Yang from CCTV Africa um, my question to you mr. deputy president is when are we going to see a broader reform of South Africa's visa policy uh, to make it easier for persons from Eastern Africa to do trade and get into South Africa as well. We've seen some easing uh, with Kenya in the last couple of weeks, but that seems to be a piecemeal approach as opposed to one wholesale uh, reform to making it a lot easier for people to get into and out of South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm called Daya Sinyasega from uh, Chigari today. Uh, my question is uh, also related to my colleagues. Uh, in last two years, Rwanda and Uganda got a bit of um, uh, poor relations, and this one led to most of the Rwandans going through a hassle to get a visa to South Africa. Uh, I just want to get it from you, Your Excellency. Can you assure us that uh, Rwandans going to South Africa will not go through uh, the hassles we go through? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, before I invite the Deputy President, uh, just to indicate I'll take a few, maybe two or three rounds. But uh, I would also want us to focus on this web Africa. Deputy President, I have the pleasure to invite you to respond to their questions. Uh, thank you. The lady from CNN, sorry I didn't catch the name initially. Uh, in relation to the political landscape, uh, South Africa is a very stable democracy. Uh, we've been a stable democracy since 1994 when uh, the African National Congress uh, won the mandate of our people to govern the country. And the ANC has done so dutifully and has done that with great purpose, with a view of ensuring that there is stability in the country and we uh, begin the process of transforming South Africa and uh, correct the imbalances of the past. And that task continues and it is pivoted on a very strong democratic system that is supported by institutions that support democracy. Our South African institutions are robust, they are strong, and strong to being durable, very, very durable. And the political landscape is not unique to South Africa. What people read in the media 
about a number of things. It's not unique. It happens all over the world. And uh, countries will go through political uh, issues and challenges from time to time. But in our case, what we are sure about and what we can rest assure anyone who is an observer of South Africa is that the South African democracy is stable, it's strong, it's robust. So South Africa Inc. is charging ahead, resolving its problems and challenges, and uh, nothing uh, that will disturb that stability is going to happen. We have far too much at stake as a country and as a democracy to allow any form of instability to derail the process that we are involved in. We've got to transform and continue transforming our country so that it delivers the objectives that they all set their minds to, to have a South Africa that is free, democratic, non-racial, non-sexist, and prosperous. We are on course to doing precisely that. And we will not turn back from that historic cause that we were given by our forebears when they formed the ANC 104 years ago. And here you are dealing with an organization that's governing the country that is 104 years old. So it is steeped in history, in tradition, it is steeped in the good things that the leaders who have preceded the current leadership have done to instill a good value system which we are proceeding along right now. Uh, a colleague from End Times talks about uh, Rwanda and South Africa the bilateral relations. Our mere presence here in Kigali, where we are participating at a fairly high level of government, and where we are also accompanied by a sizable delegation, not only of business, but also of state-owned enterprises, and may I add, non-governmental institutions which make up Team South Africa, means that South Africa and Rwanda are two countries that existing on the African continent have embraced this notion, this African notion of working together, of doing things together to achieve our 2063 objectives as a continent. And we know that all this can only be done and achieved if we work together. So South Africa and Rwanda are determined to work together, to be in cooperation and collaboration on a number of fronts. And right from the top of government, right to the bottom, wherever that bottom might be. And we enjoy really wonderful cordial relations with the leadership of this country. Uh, President Paul Kagame has welcomed the whole team of uh, government leaders, ministers here with open arms, and we continue to have discussions, uh, and these discussions will continue on a number of issues that we have to address. Uh, yes, there may be wonderful things that we have to do together, so we have to enhance that. There may be issues that we've got to address that are challenges, we're going to do that, and we continue to do precisely that. Which leads me to the other question that was asked about the ease of travel of Rwandese to South Africa when it comes to visas. This, this matter is part of the ingredients that we, 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 we're talking about and looking at, and clearly, in order to enhance integration on the African continent. This is precisely one of the things that we've got to address and solve. That there must be easy flow 
of people across countries in Africa, and if you like, between South Africa and Rwanda, that is what we would like to see. Easy flow of uh, businesses between uh, various countries, Rwanda and South Africa, especially if you like, and uh, easy flow of goods, trade, and investment. So because we want to enhance that, we are here and we want to deepen the relationship between South Africa and Rwanda. And may I add that we as South Africans have found that much as we are a larger economy, much more developed economy on the African continent, there is a lot that we are learning from what Rwanda, Rwanda is doing extremely well. And I was very quick to tell President Kagame uh, yesterday that what Rwanda has done on the ICT uh, field of wrapping the whole country uh, with a fiber optic cable and making internet free is something that we, we congratulate them on, we aspire to be, and uh, we, we, we really want to learn lessons from them, from turning Kigali into an innovation center, so we're learning. So we can only learn from friends, and that is why the friendship between Rwanda and South Africa is, is going to keep deepening. There are a number of levels that it will obviously deepen through as it uh, becomes a very, very beneficial relationship all around. Stephen Hruotes from Eyewitness News asked the question, why should investors invest in South Africa, which at the regulatory level, one has to go through hoops and loops uh, before you, you can make any headway, and yet here you get things done very quickly. Now, we have decided as a government that in as far as one of the barriers, the constraints that we have had in relation to people investing in our country has been raised very prominently by business people that our regulatory environment is a constraint. Uh, it, it, uh, we've got too many barriers for people to do business. The ease of doing business and opening business in South Africa is very complicated and convoluted. Now, we've responded to that. We've responded to that, and Minister Khadebe has addressed that on a number of occasions emanating from cabinet decisions. Uh, we've decided we're going to set up a one-stop shop where would-be investor just goes to one office, to one desk, informs the official that this is what I intend, this is what I want, and from then on that unlocks a whole plethora of permits, uh, licenses, and everything. Now, in Rwanda, they have perfected this. They say that to open a business in Rwanda just takes three hours. One businessman was congratulating President Kagame and saying, President, I congratulate you, it takes four hours. And he's reported to have said, who told you that? Because it doesn't take four hours, it takes three hours. So meaning that they've perfected it, and our being here means that we can learn. We can learn from what they have done, how they've done it, so that we can also be like Rwanda. Rwanda is doing very well when it comes to that, and they can learn from us, from a number of other things that we are doing well. Stephen says, this happens because one department is at odds with another department. And Stephen, uh, if that has been your understanding, your perception, uh, it, it will be something of the past. Because we're streamlining the way we function, the way our various government departments are going to be cooperating going forward. Another colleague uh, raised the issue uh, of, uh, yes, part of the visa uh, issues, he said, we've re addressed it in relation to Kenya. Uh, why are we doing it on a piecemeal basis? We are taking steps and determined steps 
to address this whole issue of enabling people to travel uh, in and out of South Africa. And uh, we, we've had to look at a number of uh, considerations, security, uh, enabling people to, to travel in and the documentation side, and that is, is, is being straightened out, is being ironed out, and uh, uh, we, we, we are finding solutions uh, as, as we move on. Uh, I think that addresses all the questions that were, were raised in this round of questions. And uh, my two colleagues, Minister Khadebe and uh, Minister Kele, may well want to lay emphasis on one or other issues. Maybe you should. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. Just want to add what the Deputy President has said on, on the issue of integration. And one of, one of the sessions on integration was on this uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There is a good progress in Africa to interconnect. If one takes one uh, area of uh, infrastructure of ports, rail, aviation, there are a lot of strides that are being made. Mm -hmm. As you may be aware, that our president is the champion of what is called a presidential infrastructure championing initiative on the North-South Corridor. And this morning, we gave a, a progress report of how far we are going in implementing that. But before I emphasize on this point, I need to indicate that uh, South Africa being a champion, we have started a process of fast-tracking many of these projects with the assistance of the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, and the Development Bank of Southern Africa and the Presidency in order to ensure that uh, we bring many of these projects towards bankability. In terms of the scale of this uh, North-South Corridor, the value of, of these projects amount to about 375 billion US dollars. And in terms of prioritization is the uh, INGA, Grand INGA project to bring power to Africa, is the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, is the Bait Bridge, a one-stop border facility, as well as the rail rolling stock, which South Africa, which the heads of state in their head in their meeting last year designated South Africa to be the manufacturing hub of rail rolling stock. So I'm mentioning this to highlight one point: that uh, this uh, vision, this uh, agenda 2063, mm -hmm. is being implemented as we speak in order to bring about this uh, integration. We have mentioned the issue of uh, Rwanda. Uh, President Kagame has been leading as part of this North-South corridor mm -hmm. of uh, making sure that uh, we reduce the cost of telephony in this area of East Africa. <coughs> By a stroke of a pen, the roaming charges have been eliminated and uh, uh, Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania is now part of this uh, innovation hub, as the Deputy President is saying and they're now moving towards this uh, project of uh, Connect uh, uh, South Africa. So I thought I needed just to emphasize that, uh, that uh, uh, what uh, roads started at the turn of the century, even though in South Africa there's this hashtag, roads must fall. But one thing positive he said was that uh, a road from Cape to Cairo, we are beginning to see it happening as we speak. No, thank you. I think the Deputy President covered most of the things. As he said, we also learn uh, because I, I think we first congratulate the region and the, under the leadership of the whole region mm -hmm. and Rwanda in particular and the ICT. What they've done in, the, in Rwanda was to create one network. And that's what has assisted them to be able to spread this network from Kigali to the majority of the people who are staying in the rural areas, 70% of them. We face similar challenges. Those are the things we are trying to do. For their broadband network is one network. It's not many networks duplicated all over. And that's a direction we are also trying to take in, Africa, in South Africa. But uh, also in terms of cost, particularly to telecommunication, which are being reduced, one of the things we are, we are also looking at and South African companies are leading in this. 
at the, at the AU level, the internet exchange points. Uh, in most of the countries in Africa, their internet exchange points are still somewhere in Europe mm -hmm. and so on. That increased the cost of communication quite significantly. And I think we're the first one to be awarded uh, a national uh, internet exchange point in Johannesburg, our internet service providers, and we're also giving a regional uh, in the, in the internet exchange point, and we're also going for the, for, the, for the continental one. So the South African companies are making quite strides to help reduce the cost across Africa. So I thought I should just add those at the moment that uh, uh, in terms of the cost and the infrastructure. Thank you, Deputy President and Ministers. Can we take a second round? Hillary, yourself, and then just no, give a Hillary there the back. We start with the with the women. Yeah, the yeah, after. Uh. Is there a problem there, Hillary? That's the Mr. Deputy President. Oh, okay, yes. yeah. Mr. Deputy President, yeah. Um, you. You talk about the one-stop investment shop, and I wanted to ask you, number one, can you give us some timelines? Have you set targets in terms of when it will be implemented? Mm -hmm. um, and number two, um, making the comparison with Rwanda, I wanted to ask you, is the political will there in South Africa to, um, to impose such a solution, if you like? Um, in Rwanda, I know that there were lots of special, there were obviously vested interests which had to be taken on in setting up the, um, I think it's called the Rwanda Development Board, um, which is the equivalent, I think, that, that which I imagine is what, what we would be aspiring to. Uh, there were several ministries and departments which had to be got rid of or incorporated into the board. Um, there were many attorneys and vested interests which had to be dealt with to affect the regulatory reforms and the institutional reforms that brought about this investor friendliness that we see in Rwanda. Now, um, given you know all the vested interests and departments that are there in South Africa, is the political will there to to make this happen? And uh, when will it happen? Good morning, Deputy President. Um, looking at um, <coughs> what we discussed on the fourth industrial revolution, and in order to make sure that South Africa. Let's speak a bit louder. Oh, um, I'm saying, looking at the. When we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, and one of the most important points that we need to draw on, which is development in agriculture, food security. Um, we need to look, I need to ask you, how far would you go to ensure that um, at what stage can South Af irrigation systems be implemented in most of the farms in South Africa? Um, energy, um, energy resources, alternative energy resources to meet the high demand of energy because you have had a crisis in energy in South Africa and also possible alternatives to mm -hmm. save water because the water crisis we had the previous year, we need to start looking at certain possibilities on how to restore water in South Africa to meet the demand of agriculture and developing agriculture in South Africa. But, but you didn't introduce yourself properly. Uh, I'm Neilong Hodise, and I actually don't want to talk about my dad. <laughs> okay, even Hillary didn't say where she comes from. Yes. Yes. It's Hillary Joffe from Business Day in Johannesburg. Ah. Can I, sir, can I just mention, and, and Neilie is uh, one of our top women innovators of Africa, which you want to a challenge that we had at the forum to identify the best young women innovators, and she's come all the way to join us here. We're very pleased to welcome her to this event. Thank you. Oliver. Yes, Chief. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Andy Lekumala from Power FM. Um, Deputy President, my question is about policy certainty. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that has worked in this part of the world that's been very clear for my week here in Rwanda has been um, His Excellency Kagame's 
very clear direction about where the country is going and therefore having everybody um, kind of focus on that particular direction. Um, sometimes we hear investors, perhaps also through the media, criticize our government for policy uncertainty. Uh, personally, I feel sometimes it's unfair. Sometimes it's policy we don't like. It's not necessarily uncertain. But sometimes it is uncertainty. Sometimes you do get a sense that one side of government speaks and perhaps another side is not following. And the specific example I want to raise is SOEs. We've had the Minister of Finance and, both, and also his deputy make some statements in Parliament about two particular SOEs and the response from both SOEs, uh, whether it was from the board or the chairmen of the board, is not consistent to what those ministers have been saying. And if I was an investor, that's not policy I don't like. That's clearly people who are not singing from the same hymn sheet. How, what, what kind of conversations or steps are being taken by government to make sure that we don't expose ourselves to that unnecessary criticism that I would submit is, very, is, is founded and very fair? that indeed sometimes, or a lot of times, we don't sing from the same hymn sheet. Good day, it's Siobhan Cassidy from the African News Agency. I'd like to ask Minister Twele Where if... Is it, John, is it? Cape Town, Cape Town. Um, I want to ask Minister Twele if there's any particular action points that we can, that he's going home with to try and replicate the ICT successes that we see here in Rwanda. Thank you. Here's one. That one? Oh, yeah. This is up in the Labue. Come on. Yeah, give him that. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Yinka Adigoke. I'm the uh, Africa editor for Quartz. Uh, digital business uh, platform. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up this, that so many of the questions here were about South Africa's visa policies, and, and it was, it's about the visa policy towards other Africans. And I'm, I'm you know, you talked, you mentioned security there, Mr. Uh, Deputy President. I'm curious, when you look at a 25% unemployment rate in uh, South Africa, whether is it security that's the issue, or uh, is it more about economics of your own, you know, your own, uh, your own country worrying about the unemployment levels there? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Cesar Contrabeni. I'm a journalist with Business Report in Johannesburg. Uh, my question is directed to the Deputy President. Uh, my question, uh, Deputy President, relates to the comments you made yesterday um, about the improvement that, that you, see, you say government has seen in the coordination and implementation of projects as a result of the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Committee. Um, I'd like you to perhaps give us some examples of, 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 of this improvement. Perhaps for a moment take the, put the IPP program aside, but other than that, if, if you can perhaps, you know, um, allude to some of the projects that have seen improvement in their coordination and implementation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Moses from Kenya. My, also is, uh, my question is also about, um, uh, about visa. Uh, when do you hope to eliminate uh, the restrictions, uh, especially for Kenyans? Uh, and, and there I mean uh, uh, the visa costs and maybe ease of uh, getting uh, them. Um, just a follow-up question to Minister Adebe. You mentioned the Grand Inga project. We've been talking about that year in, year out. But at the end of the day, nothing really gets done. And we've got significant political risk in the DRC as well, given the fact that we've got elections in another couple of years, sorry, a couple of months as well. So when you say that the Grand Inga, when you hold up Grand Inga as an example of the sort of infrastructure project South Africa is interested in, and yet for years nothing has happened there, we're not seeing any real concrete progress, how valid an argument is that? Okay, I think uh, on that note, uh, we should end this round. Thanks, Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Roni. Uh, the first uh, question by Hilary Joffe. Uh, the, the timeline issue in terms of uh, setting up this one-stop shop uh, 
Uh, I'll ask uh, Minister Jeff Hadebe to respond to that as he is most well placed as the minister in the presidency dealing with evaluating and monitoring performance in government. So uh, he has all the answers when it comes to that. Uh, he watches all of us like a hawk to see whether we, we live up to what we have to do. So he may well have the, the time frame in, in mind. Is there political will? Uh, and you relate what happened here and also say that they, they, they had a number of challenges that they had to navigate around. And uh, yes, the political will is there. And the political will emanates from the interaction that we've had with a number of role players in our country. The business community, the NGO community have raised this from time and time and time. And they've said, if we are indeed to begin to what's having more meaningful uh, economic growth, we've got to address this issue of the regulatory logjam that uh, is in front of uh, businesses that, that want to get ahead and get moving. And indeed, in doing so, you've got to uh, iron out a number of processes that also involve various departments. Uh, and when people relate the story that, you know, before you can get going, you've got to get a water license, you've got to get an ESCOM license, you've got to get a municipal license, you've got to get this, then you realize that there are a number of role players whose buy-in, firstly, uh, whose cooperation that you've got to get, and the political will being there has had to mean that all this needs to be ironed out. And the one-stop shop is going to precisely present that to all and sundry. And we, we calibrating this, uh, uh, Hillary, to, to a point of knowing what it means for somebody to set up a business in Bloemfontein. What hurdles do they have to go through? What it means for somebody to get a license in Pretoria? Uh, the hurdles that they have to go through and then get the various government departments to begin to align their systems to deliver this end that has been decided on through political will. And I, I am convinced that we are going to deliver an outcome that business people are going to find much more user friendly. Uh, it may not come to doing everything in three hours as they do in Rwanda, but certainly it is going to mean that uh, the regulatory framework in terms of the ease of doing business is going to be uh, made a lot better so that people can have much ease uh, of, of doing business uh, in, in, in South Africa. Minister Khadebe will answer the other bit. Uh, Neilwe, who is masquerading like a journalist, uh, 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 though she is, uh, she is a highly valued uh, uh, on the move type of person recognized by the World Economic Forum, mm. asked the question on irrigation systems, energy, as well as uh, saving water. Now, the issue of water, as you know, is a huge challenge for us in South Africa. We are a water scarce country. And we've got to conserve water uh, every hour of the day, as much as we possibly can. But we've also realized that uh, water is a huge constraint from getting our agriculture to move at a much faster pace and to deliver the outcomes that we want, particularly when it comes to uh, irrigation uh, and more especially for new uh, emerging black farmers. They often get either the land and they are able to farm, but then they don't have irrigation uh, permits, they don't have water permits, and that matter 
is being looked at very closely by the Department of Water and Sanitation uh, with a view of making it a lot quicker and easier for people to get water permits. And they, they still, because of being a water scarce country, have to have a, a huge uh, focus on the utilization of water in our country. And uh, that they are doing with a great deal of, of focus. Uh, the energy uh, reticulation system in our country is getting better and better. Uh, we, we, we faced headwinds a few months ago. Uh, almost a year ago, we, we faced headwinds. Those have now receded. Uh, our power stations are charging ahead to, to maintain uh, their, their, their power stations, their boilers and everything. And the new power stations will seen, soon be coming on stream. And the other great innovation, uh, great success, has been our independent power production process where we've invited a number of independent power producers to put power into the grid. So there we, we, we're doing extremely well in as far as renewable energy is concerned. So energy, the energy challenge, much as it was a problem last year and is still a concern, it is receding. We will soon be having sufficient energy to power the South African economy once again going forward, and it will also be a driver for our economic growth. So uh, not so much concern over that. And uh, obviously, saving water has become a huge program and a campaign in our country, and that is why the Department of Water and Sanitation is training so many young people to become plumbers, to stop the leaks. So the Stop the Leaks campaign is big, and many young people are finding gainful employment in becoming plumbers and uh, participating in this program of, of stopping our water leakage. Andile asked the question of water, uh, policy certainty. Uh, yes, this has been a concern that has been raised, and we are very alive to the concerns that have been raised in this regard. And what we can say with the resolve that we have now, also as part of the nine-point plan that we adopted uh, to make sure that from a policy point of view, we, we can have more certainty so that those business people that we deal with can be assured of the fact that when the government says this is the policy, indeed, it results in being the policy. Now, the examples that you were giving where a state-owned enterprise uh, was doing a number of things that seemed to contradict, say, for instance, what uh, the shareholder, the minister, was saying. Those are operational matters. They are not really policy-oriented uh, matters. They are operational matters. And that has been a difference of whether you sign that contract or you don't sign that contract. You go ahead with this one or that one. So those are matters that are in hand. They are being addressed. They are being handled. And uh, as we go forward, uh, blips like those will be something of the past. As we streamline the way our state-owned enterprises function and the way they are also uh, governed, because it is also a governance issue, which uh, uh, the interministerial committee that has been set up by the president on state-owned enterprises is also dealing with. We're dealing precisely with how these operational matters as the impact on governance uh, needs to be addressed and needs to be resolved. Uh, uh, Shibol, whatever, Cassidy, I don't know whether that was the name, asked the, the question to the minister. He'll an answer that one. Uh, uh, one of the colleagues, Jokan, raised the question, when it comes to visas, opening up the visa uh, policy, what do we look at? Is it security at the expense of economics, or is it economics at the expense of security? We are a government. We, we don't gamble. We don't play, uh, you know, uh, bridge or whatever game that people play. 
we are a government and when we do things we've got to have a balance we've got to balance everything take into account the interests of those who want to f travel to South Africa take into account the economic uh, benefits that we can reap from people who come to do business in South Africa and travel in South Africa be they tourists or business visitors and also take into the interest the, the security of the country this is the mandate that we've got, and we cannot drop one at the expense of the other. We've therefore got to do things in a balanced manner, look at both, and work on the basis of evidence. What is the evidence that we are dealing with, and then take decisions. So and I'm sure, uh, colleague, we will be taking very good decisions, and uh, for those who've been concerned about visas, uh, we are progressing this, uh, this process to make sure that uh, there is ease of travel of those people who want to come to South Africa, but at the same time, the security issues need to be looked at. Uh, a colleague from Business Report asked a question. Uh, we s yesterday we spoke about coordination, that coordination, uh, particularly when it comes to infrastructure projects at the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commission have yielded, uh, has yielded a great deal of benefits. Yes, indeed, it has. What it has enabled us to do is to have greater focus on all our infrastructure projects from wall to wall, you know, countrywide. We, in one place, on a dashboard, we know the projects that are underway, how they are funded, how they should be funded, who funds them, is it the municipality, is it the central government, or is it uh, the, the department concerned. So that uh, is a huge benefit, and we recommend that type of process and approach to all and sundry who would want to embark on huge projects. Whether they are huge, medium, or big ticket projects, it's important that there should be coordination. And other than, as you said, other than the independent power producer projects, what else can we showcase? We can showcase a lot of things. A lot of things, I can quote a whole number, you'll have to have time to sit here with us this whole afternoon. We know, for instance, in the past, when we have built dams, when we have built dams, and this has become possible through our knowledge, through the coordinating uh, uh, process as secretariat, that when we have built dams, we focus more on uh, building the dams, getting water into the dams, making sure that the walls of the dams are strong and the concrete is up to the right, uh, MPBIs and so on. But we've lost focus, in some cases, of reticulating that water to the people who should get the water and also of streamlining the processes of the water authority at the district municipality level and making sure that there are pipes that will be able to take the water from the dam right to the village, right to uh, the township. So that we've been able to, 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 have, uh, to get attention of uh, because of the coordinating process. That much as we may celebrate that we've built a big dam, uh, be it a dam in Limpopo, be it a dam uh, wherever in the country, but the reticulation has been a problem. So the coordination has <coughs> assisted us to then focus attention. If we build a hospital, we've uh, had great joy in building a big hospital, but then the coordination between the Department of Health uh, uh, and in terms of getting doctors and nurses in that hospital has only appeared apparent to us through the coordination process. And yet, if we hadn't had this coordination process, we would not, at the right time, been able to pay attention to things like that. So coordination has also been assisting us in terms of pricing. The pricing has been another issue that coordination has helped us with. Because pricing of projects can be very, very different. A bag of cement can be priced differently 
for various projects. So coordination assists us to have line of sight of uh, things like that. So I can go on and on. Uh, uh, a colleague from Kenya wants to know, when will the restrictions that were announced be lifted and what are the costs going to be? Well, uh, I, I can't give you date and, uh, and minutes and uh, months and so forth, but having been announced and when the Minister uh, of Home Affairs went to Kenya to announce this, uh, it meant that it's going to be done with great speed and the cost is not going to be the type of cost that should make South Africa suddenly a wealthy country. It is a cost that will be meeting the, the processing that needs to be done so that people can travel with ease uh, and not uh, uh, expensively. The Grand Inga, I'll leave to either Minister uh, Khadebe or uh, Minister Kwele to address. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. On the one-stop shop a question from Hilary Joffe, I just want to amplify what the Deputy President has said that there is a strong political will on the part of the South African government to move with speed with the effective implementation of this one-stop facility. The strong political will is demonstrated by the fact that uh, in this one-stop shop, the committee is going to is personally chaired by the president. But I need to give a background briefly of this uh, one-stop shop. So this is a joint initiative of government and business and labor mm -hmm. under the theme of invest in SA. So there's been a lot of preparatory work that has happened between government and business in particular of identifying all the obstacles that stand in the way of attracting investment into South Africa. So all those have been tabulated. This uh, program, this project started early in 2015. So we are comfortable now that we're at a process now of implementing this one-stop facility. In terms of structure, it's going to be a uh, uh, at a technical level be housed at the Department of Trade and Industry, but there will be other government departments that are going to be involved, including business as well. At an appropriate time, the President is going to be announcing all the steps that are going to be taken in order to ensure that this is effectively implemented. On the issue of the Grand Inca, it is a valid uh, concern that it has been a long time coming. But there is good progress that has happened. You'll recall that about 18 months ago, the president on his state visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo, there was a, a agreement between DRC and South Africa on this Grand Inga, and the Minister of Health, no sorry, Minister of Energy, has also piloted the ratification of the treaty into Parliament as she announced last week during his budget vote on energy. Uh, at the Head of State Summit that took place in January this year, the President gave a report on this North-South Corridor and also the issue of Grand Inga also came in. They were comfortable, the Heads of State, that uh, we've moved on this project to such an extent that this year there is going to be an international finance investment conference to promote many of these projects, including this Grand Inga. I highlighted in my earlier response that to fast track this, program, this project, uh, BCG, DPSA, and we're also going to be working as well with the African Development Bank, uh, Dr. Adesina, who is extremely passionate about the issue of energy in Africa with those five high fives that he highlighted when uh, he was uh, appointed as the head of the Development Bank. Lastly, there's also going to be a roadshow this year uh, by the president as the champion of this PICI together with other heads of state who are regional heads of this North-South Corridor. So I want to reassure you that Grand Inga is going to be happening. Time frame. Thank you. Oh, uh, oh. 
one stop shop. Yeah, on the one stop shop, I, I indicated, mm -hmm. Deputy oh, President, okay. yeah. that uh, the President chairs that committee yes. and is housed at DTI, mm -hmm. and very shortly they're going to be outlining okay. yeah. as yeah. soon as possible. But everything has been done <coughs> now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, from my side, the uh, lessons learned. Uh, what are we taking home? Just three points, please. The first one is a roaming like home arrangement, which help also to reduce costs. As SADC uh, ministers responsible for ICT, we took this decision and we gave a roadmap of three years where the rates should be decreased to, for people to roam like home. And uh, when the regulators were implementing this, they met some resistance from the operators of, as usual. And uh, what is clear, and we'll take back to the regulators and uh, so that they can spread this problem, the operators were scared that their revenues was going to drop. And that's why they were very much resisting. But uh, this case study here has actually shown us that revenues increase because the volumes increase. So we have got something to show now when they say give us uh, international study where this thing has been done successfully. Now, even the operators are reaping more revenues because people are talking to relatives across these borders we've created for ourselves. And uh, the, it's also part of that integration. Individuals were very small uh, as markets, but collectively we've got a, a market of billion. South Africa has a, a big manufacturing base. We are really looking as African countries to start manufacturing some of these gadgets here uh, in Africa uh, so that we can lower the cost and make them more affordable. On the broadband, second one is on the broadband network, is that all segments matter. Uh, sometimes we take these things for granted. The sea cables matter. That's what started the project here in Rwanda, to connect these landlocked countries to the sea cable. And uh, the backhaul network is critical. If you don't have the backhaul fiber, you can have as many of these uh, uh, <coughs> base stations, but you won't solve your problem in terms of speeds. So investing in the broadband uh, fiber network is critical because that's where all these things download their, their information for transmission. But uh, more importantly, what has been the success here is a shared mobile broadband network. Uh, whenever the, we're raising this thing as a possibility for us coming from a divided and vastly rural uh, areas, people have been saying, where did it work? Check what is happening in Europe. We say, no, we're not in Europe, we're in Africa. So now this is a success where a shared a uh, single broadband network, mobile network, is viable. The operators, when they were given this thing for the first time here, they rejected it. They say it never worked anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's a dangerous experiment. They might as well pack and go. Mm -hmm. uh, the government continued to persuade them. The president, they even said, we'll give you spectrum free. <laughs> but they were still not enticed until it was an issue of engaging, engaging for partnership, and ties, but eventually take a decision. Mm -hmm. Now, they are all benefiting from that decision. Mm -hmm. the, it, the telcos company don't have to spend money and billions investing in duplicating their infrastructure. They are joining in that one who took the decision to lead the layout of the infrastructure. So their costs, all of them, their costs have come down. So it's a very good example we're taking home that shared mobile networks also work. The last one is that uh, our challenges as we're facing as Africans are really our opportunities for innovation and actually bring relevant innovation which talks to ourselves. I think South African companies, but they're small companies, which were showcasing their work they were doing in our interaction they, they are very much welcome and appreciated by the African country. I'll just give two or, two or three examples that we are making a lot of progress uh, as South African and other African countries. I won't talk, everyone knows about mobile money in Kenya, we started there. In Pesa. Uh, in Pesa. But uh, in South Africa, there is a Go Metro, 
is a small app or company developed this app to give you real time uh, location of the public transport systems. And it has grown in a very short time to 200,000 200, users. Why? Because it was in 11 languages. So language matters when you're developing these uh, uh, apps. Uh, the other one, which is also proudly home South African, is cell gnostics, uh, a technology to help you to take blood sample, put in your gadget, upload it to the, <coughs> to the uh, cloud, uh, so that they can access it, central, analyze it, send it back to you, so that they can issue you with a diagnosis, as pre even if you are in the most remote area. They can tell you you've got diabetes, you need uh, this type of treatment. Uh, you have got malaria. So it is a useful technology for countries in Africa where the access is quite uh, 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 difficult. And lastly, uh, you all know about uh, Save Lou uh, from South Africa again. <laughs> uh, waterless toilet, easy to assemble. It doesn't require water. <laughs> Uh, that's the uh, advantage of taking your challenges and think about it so that you can provide workable solution. You just separate the, the liquids from solid. The liquids can reuse it, whether it's your, uh, any liquid. Uh, but your solid, it desiccated through heat. So it's a simple solution developed by people who are facing the challenges of sanitation uh, in, 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 in those rural areas. I think the message we are taking home and most of the people were speaking that in Africa we are moving from mines to using mines mm -hmm. for our economy to mines. <laughs> so yeah. that's the message we are taking home. Thank you very much. Th th thank you, <laughs> Deputy President and Ministers for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Colleagues, we want to thank you very much for spending time with us this afternoon. Thank WEF for the excellent arrangement, SABC for taking this briefing to Johannesburg and the whole of the African continent. Thank you very much. See you one day. <laughs> Johannesburg. Thank you. <laughs> uh,